thank each of you for your hospitality with our many guests we've had the last couple of weeks with our baptism. We've heard so many good reports from those who participated and just appreciate your heart to, to welcome those who are visiting with us over the last couple of weeks. Well, we continue in, for us, what is a 90-day cycle of prayer for persecuted Christians all over the earth. One of the things that I, as I watch the news and continue to hear just horrible stories is that Christians have been persecuted for centuries. In ancient Rome, crowds by the tens of thousands would gather in the Colosseum to watch as Christians were ripped apart by enemies. Paul Rader, commenting on his visit to this famous landmark, said, I stood uncovered to the heavens above, where he sits for whom they gladly die, and asked myself, would I, could I, die for him tonight to get this gospel to the ends of the earth? I prayed most fervently in that Roman arena, for the spirit of a martyr and for the working of the Holy Spirit in my heart as he worked in Paul's heart when he brought him on his handcuffed way to Rome. Those early Christians lived on the threshold of heaven within a heartbeat of home. Christians have always been persecuted for their faith. If you have your Bible, please turn to Paul's letter to Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. This morning we look at the letter that was written by Paul along with Silvanus and Timothy, probably from Corinth to the church in Thessalonica around 50 AD. These men had gone to the city of Thessalonica to plant a church. They weren't there very long, so they planted a church that was made up of converted Jews and Gentiles. These letters are written to encourage and strengthen these new believers who apparently immediately upon their conversion began to experience severe persecution. And as we continue to pray for the persecuted church in our own day, we see in this letter valuable instruction for us in how to pray for our brothers and sisters. I shared a few weeks ago, I think we miss much of what God has for us if we limit our prayer for the persecuted church to simply God protect them. I think there's much, much more that God would have us to pray. So as we look at this letter written by Paul and these other guys who helped right apparently back to this church where they had spent just a short amount of time or were now being persecuted let's see what Paul had for them in verse 1 of chapter 1 Paul, Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ grace to you and peace we give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing Paul does is he gives thanks to them for being faithful Christians. Paul and his fellow missionaries knew that the church in Thessalonica was in a battle. Jews who felt threatened by this new faith were proclaiming to the Roman authorities that they were worshiping a new king. And indeed they were. The letter began with words of encouragement. They reaffirmed the foundation of the church. They said to these new believers that the church was built on the foundation of God the Father and Jesus Christ His Son. It is so important for us 
to stand with brothers and sisters around the world who are fighting to hold on to a biblical faith. Those of you who were at the investiture last week or two weeks ago of the new Archbishop, our friend Foley Beach, if you were there, if you viewed it online, you saw gathered on that stage archbishops and primates from Nigeria and Kenya in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Egypt, in the Southern Cone. They were there for one reason. They were there to stand in solidarity with the Anglican Church in North America for the sake of a biblical gospel. That's why they were there. They were there to say, we recognize that you are wanting to stand on the truth of the gospel and we choose to stand with you. Paul goes on and thanks God for their faithfulness and praying for them. Their prayer focus was on their work of faith and their labor of love and their steadfast hope in Jesus Christ. So as we pray for the persecuted church, we give thanks to God for their witness in a hostile environment. We thank God for their steadfast commitment to Jesus Christ as the answer to every hope and need that they will ever face. And our prayer is that their example would both challenge us and inspire us. Paul goes on and commends their stand for faith. In verse 4, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. There is a reason that Christians can stand firm in the face of unimaginable persecution. They've seen the power of God at work. The true gospel of Jesus Christ had come to them not just in the words that Paul spoke, but apparently by, also by evidence of the Holy Spirit among them. As best we can tell, Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy only spent three or four weeks in Thessalonica. They were just there for a very short time. The church was established very quickly. And the roots of endurance had to go deep quickly. The Holy Spirit had been at work in the lives of these new Christians to such a degree that they were able very quickly to withstand the assault that came upon them. Their faith was genuine. They were willing after a very brief time to stand firm in the faith. And then Paul commended them for their willingness to follow godly leaders. He said, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake? And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. There was something about Paul's life and Sylvanus' life and Timothy's life that was catching. The Thessalonian church had seen in Paul and the others a faith that they could follow and pattern their own lives after. So there's a theme that runs through these verses that we would do well to grab a hold of this morning. It was not just their words, as powerful as they were, that made a difference. But it was also the power of the Holy Spirit and also the lives of those who were speaking. Paul and the others were able to say, as Paul said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Follow my example as I follow Christ. I am moved by the faithful leadership of men like Canon Andrew White in the midst of this persecution who continues to stand firm those are the kind of men that we honor and we respect as they walk with Christ. 
But then finally this morning, what Paul, as he so often does, he comes back to talk about the power of the gospel. If you've been around here very long, you know that I love to talk about the power of the gospel. In Romans chapter 1, Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The power of the gospel ruled Paul's heart. And so when he saw it in others, he was quick to make mention of it. The evidence of the power of the gospel in the Thessalonian church was seen in their power of the gospel over affliction. The end of verse 6, he says to the church, You received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. It's so easy when we read God's Word to kind of skip over verses or just kind of not, not to take time to listen. You receive the Word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So often those two things don't coexist in our lives, do they? They receive the Word. They are being persecuted. And yet their persecution did not rob them of the joy that was given to them by the Holy Spirit. We see the power of the gospel of the new life. Verse 9, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There was something that took place that allowed these pagans, these idol worshipers, to see the truth of the living God and give their lives to Jesus Christ. The power of the gospel changes men's lives. It was the gospel that the Thessalonians turned from the worship of powerless idols to the power of the living and true God. Paul also spoke about the, the gospel as the power for a future hope. Verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. They saw in this newfound faith, they saw life and they saw hope. They saw something that their idols could not deliver to them. They understood very quickly that the persecution of this present age will one day come to an end. And we will be with Jesus forever. We pray for the persecuted church. We pray that the gospel will empower them to remain steadfast. We pray that the gospel will give them hope for tomorrow. We pray that the gospel will give them the strength to endure persecution. That the gospel will give them joy and affliction that their lives will draw others into a new faith in Jesus Christ. This past Thursday marked the 459th anniversary of the martyrdom of early Anglican bishops Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer. Both Ridley and Latimer were burned at the stake in Oxford, England on October the 16th, 1555 for one reason, for refusing to compromise their commitment to the truth of the gospel. As he was being tied to the stake, Nicholas Ridley prayed, O Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee even unto death. 
I beseech thee, Lord God, have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. Ridley's brother had bought, brought some gunpowder for the men to place around their necks so that death would come more quickly. But Ridley still suffered greatly. With a loud voice, Ridley cried out, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. It's hard to even imagine. It says the wood was green. It burned only Ridley Ridley's legs without touching his upper body. He was heard to repeatedly call out, Lord, have mercy on me, I cannot burn. Let the fire come upon me, I cannot burn. One of the bystanders finally brought the flames to the top of the pyre to hasten Ridley's death. Latimer died much more quickly as the flames quickly rose. Latimer encouraged Ridley, be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust never shall be put out. Sad news today is that that flame is, is flickering. Not just in the church in England, but all over the world. So as we pray for the persecuted church, one of the things we want to be faithful to pray. Lord, may every death fuel the fire of the expansion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the glory of God. May those who are giving their lives not give their lives in vain. If the Lord chooses to take their lives, may their blood may their blood draw others to the cross. <laughs> read stories of men who counted and an honor to give their lives for the gospel should inspire us and motivate us. We may never experience the persecution that others in the world experience today, but by God, if we can pray for them. We can pray that God would have mercy and those who take their very lives would see Jesus in their deaths. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.